All right, so um, I'll be talking about chapter 11, the triple oxygen isotopes in silica water and carbonate water uh, systems. Really, this chapter is talking a lot about uh, equilibrium precipitation and disequilibrium and how we can use the triple oxygen isotope uh, values to, di to differentiate between the two. And as with most of the talks that we've heard today, uh, there's a lot in chapter 11, and it's way too much to fit into a 25 minute talk. In the chapter, we go over uh, mineral water oxygen isotope thermometry in general, and then we talk about the kinetic effects that might result in oxygen isotope disequilibrium. And then we go into the silica water triple oxygen isotope equilibrium fractionation and the carbonate water equilibrium fractionation. And then we take these equilibrium fractionation lines and use them to interpret ancient sediments and then talk about the triple oxygen isotope fractionation between quartz and calcite. For this talk, uh, I'll really just be focusing on the carbonate water triple oxygen isotope equilibrium fractionation line and then applying that line to ancient sediments only in regards to carbonate since we heard um, the talk by David Zakharov for the silicate. Uh, silica sediment geologic record. So why are we interested in the triple oxygen isotope values of carbonates? Well, um, in a nutshell, it's because of the uh, variation in the calcite water fractionation lines that have been produced um, over the last uh, 50 to 60 years uh, for just delta O18. So on this graph, we have the fractionation on the y-axis, temperature on the x-axis, and these are just a few examples of the literature of the calcite water fractionation lines. And you can see the, var the variation. So one of the red lines uh, was produced using synthetic calcite. And then another purple line by O'Neill et al. Uh, is also using synthetic calcite. They don't agree with each other. But that uh, O'Neill et al. does agree with the biogenic calcite of Epstein et al. Aragonite calcite water fractionations generally have larger fractionation factors per temperature except for when you compare it to the Ty Copeland data in 2007 from slow growing uh, abiogenic cave calcite from Devil's Hole. This has the largest uh, cal calcite water fractionation factor close to the aragonite water fractionation factor. And with Delta 18 alone, you can't really tell which uh, fractionation line really represents equilibrium. And so we were hoping that uh, triple oxygen isotopes, isotopes might uh, help answer this question. Back in 2013, Watkins et al. published a nice paper looking at why that difference might exist in synthesized calcite. Um, for the, and on this graph, this is a graph of kind of the summary of his, of his work, where we have the fractionation factor again on the y-axis, temperature on the x. And he um, synthesized calcite with and without a catalyst using carbonic anhydrase. And the solid symbols here are the example, are the fractionation factors in the non-catalyzed experiments and the white squares are those from the catalyzed experiments. And you can see that the catalyzed experiments produce uh, much more reproducible fractionation factors. Uh, the gray bar represents the previously proposed uh, fractionation factors in the literature. And you can see, although they weren't really going after it, proposing a new alpha for uh, Delta O18 calcite water, they were on the lower end of the published data. And again, here's the two cave um, slow growing calcites from Tremaine et al. 2011 and Copeland 2007 with uh, larger fractionation factors. So the first thing we did um, for looking at triple oxygen isotope values in carbonates uh, is looking at each type of carbonate and seeing if there's any difference in the triple oxygen isotope fractionation. So we looked at synthetic carbonate with and without that carbonic anhydrase catalyst. We looked at biogenic and abiogenic calcite and biogenic and abiogenic aragonite. Here's some SEM images of the synthetic carbonate samples. The top row uh, are the samples produced without the catalyst, and the bottom row is with the catalyst. And we produced samples at three different temperatures, 5 degrees, 20 degrees, and 40 degrees Cs. Um, all the results produce nice calcite, except for the 5 degrees C sample, which we produced betarite. Um, betarite has, or I'm sorry, the 5 degrees C without carbonic anhydrase where we produce betarite. Betarite has a larger fractionation factor than calcite, wa uh, calcite water, betarite water. And um, so we did not include the five degrees C sample uh, without the catalyst in any of our calculations. For natural carbonate samples, we have four modern brachiopods where we know the water that it grew in. Um, this is biogenic calcite. We have some brachiopods from the Palau Islands that grew in 30 degrees C water, a brachiopod off the coast of California in 10 degrees C water, and then two Antarctic brachiopods around zero degrees C. We compared this data 
to abiogenic cave calcite from Devil's Hole, along with the, its coexisting water, and then compared both of the carbonates to the uh, uh, calcite, sorry, to the marine biogenic aragonite and a marine abiogenic aragonite. Uh, just note that the, the aragonite samples that we have are only from really about one, uh, one temperature interval, 25 degrees C. So here's the results just looking at delta O18 before we move into the triple oxygen isotope results. We have the fractionation factor on the y-axis, temperature again on the x-axis, this time it's over 1,000 1, over T, so lower temperatures to the right. These blue circles then are those Antarctic uh, marine calcites. And a big takeaway from this um, image is that there was really no fractionation factor between the different carbonates. So the red va values are the synthetic uh, calcite, the blue is the marine calcite, and the white circles are the marine aragonite, and then here is the brown uh, devil's hole. And our fractionation factor, um, our relationship, for the delta O18 calcite water is on the higher end of the range of published values, uh, similar to the, the Copeland uh, fractionation factor and the range of values was in this gray uh, band. So what does this look like in triple oxygen isotope space? So first we'll look at it as the theta temperature relationship. And we like to look at theta for uh, when it's an equilibrium process because uh, theta will vary with temperature. Um, Daniel Herwartz went over the definition of theta, but just as a quick review, because it was a little while ago, on this graph, we have little delta O17 on the y-axis, little delta O18 on the x-axis. And if this red diamond is uh, a water sample and this green diamond is its coexisting calcite, then just simply taking the slope between these two points would give us our theta, and that theta should have a relationship with temperature. So here's a result of that. Here's just the calcite from the study. We have theta on the y-axis, temperature on the x-axis, again, lower temperature to the right. And we do see a relationship with um, temperature. We, when we fit this data, we always fit it to the theoretical high limit of 0.5305 for theta. This is what the fit looks like. And the aragonite data um, plots a little bit lower in theta. Again, this is only one sample, and so more research should probably be done to try and refine our, our aragonite water uh, theta temperature relationship. How does this look in relation to the literature? Um, there's only been two published studies in addition to our paper um, about any kind of calcite water fractionation for triple oxygen isotopes. Um, Bergel et al. in 2020 published a paper using uh, freshwater mollusks, which was aragonite and did not find a theta temperature relationship, and neither did uh, Vorent Soa et al. in 2020, who synthesized an aragonite and calcite mixture. Um, we don't really know why there's such differences in the, the sets of data for the theta values. Um, hopefully with further research and analytical methods, they, they become more in line. We do think our results are robust um, just compared to theory. So the yellow dashed line is a theoretical theta, theta temperature relationship from Hales et al. And then the gray line is for Gao and Zhao in 2019. Um, and they both agree pretty well. Our, Zero degree sample might be a little bit higher for theta than, than predicted by theory, and hopefully that comes in line with more, with more measurements. Uh, the difference between the calcite and the aragonite uh, theta temperature relationships is not predicted by theory, as we saw in Edwin Schrobel's talk. Uh, and again, hopefully with more aragonite measurements, we can uh, resolve those differences. So what does this look like in triple oxygen isotope space? where we're gonna develop this equilibrium fractionation line. So here we, all the graphs will look like this from here on out. So we have big delta O17 on the y-axis, little delta O18 on the x-axis. All um, samples are normalized to a seawater uh, value of zero per mil for delta O18 and minus 0.005 for uh, big delta O17. And this is the synthetic calcite. The solid diamonds are with carbonic anhydrase, so catalyzed and the uh, empty white symbols are without carbonic anhydrase. And immediately there's a good um, relationship with temperature where the colder samples and the warmer samples, uh, the warmer samples have a higher big delta O17. The black is the best fit for uh, this data and these hash marks are the, the temperature uh, formation calculated using the best fit. How's this looking compared to biogenic calcite? Here is again the uh, brachiopod samples and again there's a nice temperature relationship. Uh, where the tropical brachiopods and 30 degrees C water uh, plot here, and then the Antarctic brachiopods plot uh, lower. 
And the best fit, oh, and sorry, the abiogenic carbonate uh, also plots very similar to the 30 degrees C brachiopod. So again, there's no difference between the two. And the best fit is exactly the same as the uh, synthetic calcite. Here's the aragonite data. And again, because that theta temperature relationship was a little bit different, so is our equilibrium fractionation line. And again, this is not predicted by theory. And so uh, we don't really know which one is correct as of yet, but I'm sure with more analyses coming out, it will uh, be resolved. So this is how all the data looks. And again, these little uh, hash marks are the temperature of formation. And how can we actually use this when we look at geologic samples or uh, terrestrial samples? So here's the marine uh, or the biogenic carbonate and the equilibrium fractionation line, again, tied to seawater. And the hash marks are temperatures in degrees C. And a sample has to plot on this equilibrium fractionation line in order to form an equilibrium with a modern ocean composition. Uh, in this triple oxygen isotope space, there really is only one right answer. And so if it doesn't plot on this black line, then it could not have been preserving its uh, equilibrium temperature with a modern ocean. So how can we use this? And why is it powerful? So here's just two random samples that I made up, which have the same delta O18 value but the red actually plots on the equilibrium fractionation line. So we can say with confidence that this um, formed in equilibrium at 20 degrees C in a marine, marine water. However, the blue sample plots below the equilibrium fractionation line. We'll learn later that this is kind of a diagenesis field and um, cannot have been formed in equilibrium with a modern ocean. The, uh, the, the strong, uh, part of the triple oxygen isotope measurements is the fact that with just delta 18, they have the same actual delta 18 value, and it's only with triple oxygen isotopes that we see these differences. Another thing you can do with a triple oxygen isotope equilibrium fractionation line is you can flip the fractionation line and have the origin actually be on the, the sample instead of the water. And where it crosses for temperature is this range of temperature for and water composition. And so with the sample we know formed in marine waters, it crosses seawater at 20 degrees C. But then with the blue sample, it does not cross anywhere between uh, ocean water, so it can't be formed in ocean. It barely even reaches the, the meteoric water line. And so um, we'll learn that this is probably some kind of water rock interaction fluid that, that altered its value, theoretically. So how can we use this triple oxygen isotope space for uh, geologic samples and why? Well, we've known since 1953 that when we look at the geologic record, we no longer uh, have the water that it formed in. And so that's an assumption. And we need that uh, water value in order to calculate temperature. And then also we don't know the cons uh, whether the delta 18 of the calcite is preserving its, its value over geologic time or if it's altered. So these are the two major assumptions that hopefully triple oxygen isotope values will resolve. And um, we've kind of already gone over this quite a few times today, but this is the carbonate record um, over the Phanerozoic from Beiser and Prokop. This is using biogenic calcite, uh, brachiopods, and forams and belemnites. And over the last 500 million years, there's been this secular trend where the values have increased towards modern. And with delta 18, we don't really know how to um, resolve this increase because there's three possible reasons. Um, one, the ocean ice cap composition changed over time, the temperature of the ocean changed over time, or that diagenesis tends to affect older carbonates rather than modern. So uh, when we look at triple oxygen isotope values in the geologic record, how can we use this equilibrium fractionation line to resolve these three possible scenarios? First, we have to recognize that the ocean changes between minus one and plus one per mil just based on whether there's the presence or absence of ice sheets. And so what I do is I bracket the equilibrium fractionation line with these two gray uh, equilibrium fractionation lines for minus one and plus one and kind of give this a buffer to in account for variations in the ocean. And now the for the three scenarios, if the delta 18 value of the ocean changed over time, then using the model from Sengupta and Pack, the uh, ocean triple oxygen isotope value should follow this pink line up until minus six at the beginning of the Phanerozoic. And the equilibrium fractionation line would no longer be at zero, but at 500 million years ago, it'd be at minus six up here where this pink dash line is. And so if we have a modern brachiopod that plots with a modern ocean ice habit composition, we, as we 
uh, analyze older brachiopods, it, we would expect the uh, values to kind of go in this direction. Now, if only the temperature of the ocean changed over time, then this equilibrium fractionation line won't move at all in this space. And so as you get older uh, samples, it'll just track up the equilibrium fractionation line to a warmer temperature. And then if diagenesis overprinted any signal, then you might have this uh, rock that initially formed with a modern ocean composition, but then meteoric water or some kind of diagenetic fluid infiltrated the rock. And using a simple fluid rock mixing model um, that Daniel Horowitz uh, talked about in his talk, the rock will also change depending on the, both the composition of the diagenetic fluid and the temperature of alteration and the fluid rock ratio. But in general, we would expect samples to kind of plot below the equilibrium fractionation line for diagenesis. And so just to kind of review, below the fractionation line is, is a diagenesis field. If it tracks up the equilibrium fractionation line, then we could say that the ocean temperature changed over time. And if it pops above the equilibrium fractionation line, then we're looking at a different ocean composition over the Phanerozoic. So uh, I looked in the record, uh, the literature record, to um, all of the triple oxygen isotope values of any kind of geologic uh, marine samples. And uh, I have about seven samples starting from the Cretaceous back to the Ordovician. And we'll just kind of slowly build them on the graph. So we'll start with the Cretaceous. Um, and there was three samples for the Cretaceous. One was uh, coccolis that was published in Fossil et al. 2020, and then um, a belemnite and a brachiopod. And only a belemnite is plotting an equilibrium with a modern ocean um, composition and a temperature between 12 and 15 degrees C. The coccolis and the brachiopods are looking like they're, they're slightly altered. Triassic, there was a analyzed two ammonites, a smithian ammonite and a spathian ammonite, and they plot well in this uh, diagenesis realm. Ben Passy uh, et al. in 2014 published a value on a Permian um, brachiopod, and that also plots more in this equal or diagenesis um, field. Carboniferous brachiopod, also diagenesis field. Devonian brachiopod, same story. But then there was a Silurian brachiopod that actually plots in equilibrium with a modern ocean um, with a temperature between about 28 to 30 degrees C. And so this is saying that at least during the Silurian where this brachiopod was growing, uh, the ocean was similar to modern. And then the Ordovician brachiopod fragment also plots in this diagenesis field. So again, this is kind of how all the data looks together where there's only two samples that have so far been analyzed that suggest equilibrium with a modern ocean composition. And none of the data is suggesting a different delta 18 composition. It's also not following this temperature trend since um, 30 to zero is the modern range of uh, ocean temperatures. But many samples are looking like they are diagenetically altered. It should be noted that at least in the blue um, symbols, these, these samples were screened petrographically for any kind of diagenesis. Uh, and still, they look like they are diagenetically altered using triple oxygen isotope values. And just to rehash the um, importance of what you can see using triple oxygen isotope values is this gray band is the modern delta O18 range of brachiopods from Braun et al. 2019. And a lot of the data actually have uh, delta O18 values that are within the modern range of uh, delta O18 values of brachiopods. And so it's only with triple oxygen isotope values, the additional big delta O17 measurements that we see that there, that there is uh, it's alteration. So, what additional information can we get from samples that are already altered? Well, if we take, this is the mid Ordovician brachiopod, and using that fluid rock mixing model and an alteration water of about minus 15 per mil, and it's meteoric water, so it's big delta O17 is plus 0.03 per mil, then using a fluid rock mixing model, you can trace back through, assuming that the ocean was zero during the Ordovician. It's a pretty safe assumption that the delta 18 value of the ocean was zero per mil, since during the Silurian, it was at least zero per mil. Now, with only one sample, if there is like a range using this fluid rock mixing model, because a lot of assumptions are going into it. And so I could also use an alteration water of minus 10 per mil and um, produce an, an environment that this brachiopod lived in being about 10 degrees C. We can go and do this, this same kind of test for many different samples. Um, and all the samples that we already they talked about, but really I want to focus on the Smithian and Spathian ammonites. And um, here we trace through the diagenesis 
uh, using an alteration water of minus 10 per mil, and the uh, Smithian and the Spathian had a 10 degree C uh, difference in its initial uh, precipitation environment. And their environment was uh, 10 degrees C and 20 degrees C. And this is interesting because it's the same difference in uh, temperature difference that we see in the phosphate record. The, uh, however, the phosphate record is suggesting that, that the ocean uh, during the Smithian Spathian was closer to 50 degrees C and 40 degrees C, um, much, much warmer than is being suggested. And what's interesting is that the ammonite data just with Delta 18 alone is also suggesting these same kind of temperatures. However, we know that this carbonate is altered. And so it's only with um, using this fluid map rock mixing model that we can suggest cooler temperatures. This has implications because biodiversity was lowered during the Smithian Spathian boundary. I uh, think because the uh, waters were so warm, but perhaps it was a different reason for this biodiversity loss. And so in conclusion, you know, we see the secular trend over time in the Delta 18. And perhaps the signal is overprinted by diagenesis. And if we take our samples that we've, we've already looked at during this talk, and use a fluid rock mixing model to correct it, then perhaps this is really where the initial samples lie, closer to a modern range, and that, that secular trend is now flattened and, and not quite as pronounced. And so the ocean can be both zero per mil and modern um, ocean temperatures for the, over the Phanerozoic. With that, I wanna thank you for listening. And as you're reading the chapter, if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to contact either myself or Zach Sharp. And I also want to bring everyone's attention to a uh, session that will be uh, had at Goldsmith 2021. And so if you have any new research that you want to present, then uh, please consider submitting to applications and advances in triple auction ISCOP systematics. Thanks. Thank you, Jordan. So do we have questions? We have one question. It is how to distinguish samples record ocean O18 change, but also experience diagenesis from samples only sees one of them. Um, can you repeat the question? Sure. So it's how to distinguish samples record ocean O18 change, but also experience diagenesis from samples only sees one of them. Yes, the uh, author is asking, can you distinguish two parameters from one measurement? I mean, the author can unmute himself. Um, so if the sample is overprinted by diagenesis, then all we can do is use the fluid rock mixing model to uh, suggest a pristine value. And so you, you do have to assume an ocean in which that, that sample formed if it's diagenetically altered. You'd have if you were going to trace a different um, ocean composition, then you would need pristine samples to really see that. I think. I so would have a question. Um, can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Okay, it's it's well, John. I guess that you you know follows this recipe on you know choosing which samples are pristine and which not. You know, with low magnesium and everything. Uh, have you found anything that you know among these proxies that were compatible with oxygen isotopes? For instance, the one sample that you had from this, I think it was a Silurian that seemed to be least altered. Is there any of these you know parameters um, then also pointing to this, or is it well basically you otherwise you would say that all these parameters are useless because you still if altered samples? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so all the samples were screened for uh, diagenesis and all the samples were published in previous papers suggesting that these were the most pristine samples using these other kinds of analyses. And I think it was the best case scenario. Those are the tools that we had. However, with the triple auction isotope values, we're seeing that there are these very slight alterations that the petrographically or other, you know, tool uh, geochemically that we can't see. Well, I also have one question. So the most of the signal of diagenesis is actually in delta 18 R. 
uh, all your uh, trend is basically parallel to this uh, uh, um, in the range in B cup 17 or is only like 0 0.04 per million environmental temperature. So it's like quite challenging measurements. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, have we combined it with uh, clumped isotopes or any other parallel efforts in the same direction? Yeah, yeah I'm working on a project with that right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you.